Um, Larry Listell, um, Larry's been an active participant so far. He's from BioStream Environmental up in Washington. He's going to talk about strategic approaches to supplementing the coho salmon in the Queets River in Washington. So please welcome uh, Larry Listell. Well, just by way of introduction, uh, I've been involved in fish management and research for about 35 years or so and done most of my work in in the Pacific Northwest, uh, actually most of it in western Washington. Um, for about the last five years, I've been involved in the Klamath, working with the Urox and the Karooks on a coho research project. That's been uh, really exciting. We're not going to talk about that today, but we're going to talk about <clears throat> one of my other favorite rivers, the Queets River, on the Olympic uh, coast uh, in uh, western Washington. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is summarize the results of, of, of a code supplementation project that, that took place between about 1989 and, and uh, 2002. <clears throat> there are two papers that summarize or, or that present the, the basically the genesis and, the, and uh, results, the, some of the early results of the work. I'm just going to summarize the kind of highlight those uh, those papers. Originally we laid out the the rationale for the approach in a, in a paper back in 1993 but we actually we started doing some work in the 1980s with with uh, some small-scale fry releases and we as a result of that basically that that led us to the conclusion that we were going to use smolts in the uh, in the program here. So the Queets watershed, it's 450 square miles. It's right in the heart of the Olympic Peninsula. It, it comes off the uh, south face of Mount Olympus. <clears throat> and just by way of scale, you know, yesterday we were talking about the Scott River a little bit. And, and Sean, you were calling it uh, Scott Creek a, a couple of times. But, but just, just by way of scale, Queets is 450 square miles. The Scott River Basin is 800 square miles. So, you know, that, that's not Scott Creek down there, that's Scott River. This is a, this is a smaller watershed I'm going to talk about. The, the Shasta, just for your information, is also about 800 square miles. So we're talking about a big territory in this, in this basin. This is a smaller, smaller area. The whole river is to the north, the Cornell River is to the south. Some of you have probably been out to see that country. I'm going to focus on the work that we did in the Clearwater subbasin, which is which is exactly a third of the of the watershed, so it's it's about 150 square miles. But the project, uh, the the supplementation work was was carried out in the uh, in the in the full basin. And just kind of give you a little orientation here. This is the land ownership in the uh, the Queets Basin. A big chunk of the Queets is in the national park. The Clearwater is heavily managed for timber production. It's either state-owned or privately owned, but basically the entire Clearwater is, is managed for timber production. The Queets is a diverse system. Lots of tributaries, lots of different kinds of tributaries, and here's just a picture of, of uh, some of the in-stream habitat. We have uh, low gradient. I'm going to talk about some low gradient tributaries. We have high gradient tributaries. Uh, this is a picture of the, uh, th th these are, this is basically the Queets system, pictures of the Queets system. So this is what the clear water looks like up in the middle part of the, the watershed. This is the Queets, very different kind of a river than, than the, um, than the clear water. And uh, in both the Clearwater and the Queets, we've got quite an assortment of, of off-channel habitats, and this is, these are pictures of some of the types of off-channel habitats. So right here, in this picture, the Clearwater River is over here, but you see right here, surrounded by some still standing timber, there's a pond there, and there's a little egress channel that goes out of that pond towards the, the Clearwater River. So there's a number of these ponds along the Clearwater River. Here's a picture of another one. And over in the Queets, we have off-channel habitats. In the, like this is a very, very extensive off-channel network in the lower part of the, uh, the river. And then we have some like, groundwater channel types of habitats. So quite an assortment of habitat in the, in the watershed. 
And <clears throat> we've had long-term monitoring going on in the watershed. So beginning in about 1980, we implemented a very extensive smolt enumeration program. So this just shows you what, we, what we've been doing basically in the Clearwater system. And all of these, these, uh, these yellow ovals represent sites where trapping occurs to enumerate coho smolts that are, that are leaving the system. All the coho smolts are coho wire tagged and for assessing uh, fishery contribution, that sort of thing, but, but that also gives us the ability to estimate the total yield of coho smolts leaving the Clearwater system at near the mouth using a, uh, an inclined plane scoop trap. And we have a similar level of work that, that is sort of going on in the, in the uh, Queets subbasin. Spawning escapements are monitored annually. We use red surveys, very extensive red surveys throughout the, uh, throughout the basin. So here's the problem that, uh, at least the way we perceive it, this is a little, little different kind of a situation than, than what we're talking about here uh, at the, in this workshop on the Shasta and, and the Klamath. But the problem as it was perceived in the, in the 1980s, so, so as I'm going through this, realize that when we, the genesis of this was at a completely different time. Fisheries were really the big, the big issue in the 1980s. And it was believed at that time that the coal run was, was badly underescaped. And there were very extensive ocean fisheries along the coast and up into British Columbia, as you know. There were very high harvest rates, particularly in British Columbia. And those fisheries were outside of domestic control. So we, you know, this was pre-treaty with, with uh, Canada. So it was, a, it was a different ball game at that time. And as a result of, of a number of things that were going on on the, uh, the Washington coast and with with uh, the involvement of treaty tribes and fisheries and so on. There was a set of, of um, court ordered, for this particular river and for several of the rivers along the coast, there was, a, uh, there were, there was an escapement goal policy that was established by court order and it was actually an escapement goal range and I'll explain that in a moment. But what this did for the terminal fishery is that basically the, the treaty tribes were being squeezed. They were being squeezed between what was happening in the ocean and the escapement policies and, and they, were, they were at the end of the line. So that was part of the, part of the issue. This is a picture chart <clears throat> of, the, of estimates of the age three recruit run size for, this is Queets Co. The, the, uh, uh, for the total basin. Um, so here, here, here are, whoop, gotta watch what button you press here. So basically all I'm showing here is just the um, estimated escapements from 1979 to 1989 and then the H3 recruits. The difference between the two, of course, is, is what's being taken in, in all the various fisheries. Here's the escapement goal range that was established by court order. It was quite a wide range, uh, 50, I think it was 50, I think it's 5,800 to 14,500. And uh, you can see with the escapement, uh, escapements that, that were occurring in the system, basically we were at the lower end of the range. And there was, there was a strong desire to probe into the upper part of the range, the, the middle or the upper part of the range. So uh, there was a lot of, a lot of uh, sort of encouragement to, uh, to, to make that happen. So what we, what we came up with, kind of a, kind of a collaborative approach that, that de developed was, was to uh, uh, use supplementation to try to probe up into the escapement goal range. So the, the whole point was to increase spawners for purposes of probing. So we didn't see this as a long-term solution. We saw it as a, as a short-term experimental approach to basically probe that probe that escapement goal range. And the idea was to use native wild broodstock. And that was, that was uh, 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 selected based on the, some of the fry stuff that we were doing, as I noted, but also Tom Nicholson had recently published a paper, 1986. Some of you, I hope, are familiar with that paper. Um, it's a very good paper. 
And here's basically what Tom uh, did and found that I think is really important for, for this workshop. So what Tom did was they were sort of faced with the same kind of thing. They were dealing with the same kinds of issues down on the Oregon coast, and they, so they had come up with this idea of using uh, supplementation. And what they were going to do was to, was to outplant uh, uh, zero-age fish, essentially fry into, into streams, uh, and increase the density of, of uh, summer juveniles. They did that in three years, 1980 through 1982. And um, so let me show you what the way this works here. So here's, there's two graphs here. So this is spawners per kilometer, and this is juveniles per square meter of pool habitat. So, so the three brood years that they started, were, that they were working with for planting were 1979 to 1981. And so before they planted fry, these, they didn't have any data for 1979 here, but, but the S and the U, this just simply stands for stocked and unstocked. So these are the spawner densities in 1980 in, in a selected group of streams that, that they called stock, the streams to be stocked, then they had their control streams that were left unstocked. So... Uh, when they started, these are the densities, stocked and unstocked, in 1980 and 81. So then in, in the summer, or rather the spring of 1980, they released fry, hatchery fry. They used uh, hatchery fish um, to, to uh, get the fry. They released fish in 1980, 81, and 82. What this shows is the densities during the summer, stocked and unstocked. So basically what they did was they really increased the summer density of juveniles in, in uh, the stocked streams. So these fish, like the 1980 fish, these fish would have smolted in 1981 and they would have come back in 1982. So here are the spawning densities, 1982 to 1984. Basically what, what it shows is the spawning densities in the two groups of streams were about the same now, okay? So, <clears throat> so it goes from this situation to this situation, then these fish spawned, and then when they went out the following summers and looked at the, the density of, of uh, juveniles, this is what they found. So 1983 to 1985, stocked and unstocked. Basically, this is a much different situation in these three years than what they saw for spawners and then from what they started with, with the densities that they had uh, reached with, with planting. So the, the conclusion was, from, from Tom's work, what he concluded in his paper was that was that uh, hatchery fish were much less fit, they performed more poorly, and that the, the hypothesis was that, it, that this was due to timing differences, spawning timing differences, that, that they were using basically domesticated hatchery fish, that, that, uh, that timing had been advanced on spawning, and these fish were simply not as fit to survive in the, uh, in the environment in the wild. Question? run through that again for me. I didn't, I, I'm not following the graph. Oh, you're not, yeah, it's a, yeah, you got to kind of look at this. So this is, this is important. So, so we've got, uh, we're going we're gonna to release fish in brood years 79 through 81, and we're not going to supplement in 82 to 84, direct supplementation. So they, they released fry in these three years, increase the density compared to the unstocked streams. You see that. So they really boosted the densities. These fish then smolted, came back as adults to spawn, a mixture of fish coming back to the stock streams. And they, the, the result was that the densities, if you look at this, the average densities are roughly about the same uh, spawning densities, whether it was a stock stream or an unstocked stream. These fish spawned and they created the, the juveniles the following summer. So this would have been the summers of 83 through 85. <clears throat> the result was that they found 
the densities of, of uh, juveniles in those summers much less. And so the conclusion was that, was that the hatchery fish that were spawning, the, the hatchery origin fish, that came back to spawn naturally, chose their mates, did all that thing, that they were, they were much less fit and, and, and uh, did not produce at the rate that, that uh, true wild fish did. And so then they, can, they hypothesized that this was due to, to timing differences. Um, so the approach that we took, first of all, we, based on the other work that we had done with fry, we decided we wanted to use smolt supplementation as opposed to fry supplementation because what we found was that even though you wanted to try to minimize interactions between, say, fry that you're going to put out, supplemented fry, and wild fry, there's so much competition that goes on at the juvenile life stage with coho that basically we found we were, we were, we were to a large extent, we were replacing wild fish with hatchery fish when we did our fry releases. So, so we decided to essentially really, well, to, to release smolts, to avoid that interaction in the juvenile stage. So the smolts go out, come back as adults, and choose their mates and spawn and so on. So the approach was to use natural origin spawners only for broodstock, adults and jacks. We captured the fish with gill nets, pull nets, and seines, spawned them artificially, used a one-to-one -one, uh, sex ratio, and, and, and mated uh, randomly. And, the, and in the clear water, and I'll show you in a moment, we basically targeted three areas for capturing fish and then for, for uh, releasing fish. The progeny were reared till late winter as yearlings, and then we took them to acclimation ponds and strategically located sites. All juveniles were marked for subsequent ID, and then the release strategy was based on a life history perspective that I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain to you here. So this is, this is kind of a model, a conceptual model of based on the, the work that we had been doing, a lot of assessment work in the Queet system and in the Clearwater uh, for a number of years, this is, this is what we saw happening in the Clearwater system for how coho were using the, the, uh, the sub-basin. So basically what you have is, is what this shows is if you took, the, took all the different types of habitats that coho were using in the Clearwater system, you could sort of divide them up into these five different types. So here we have the lower main stem. Here we have low gradient uh, tributaries, kind of your classic coho, low gradient coho streams, off channel ponds, the upper main stem that tended to be steep, and, the, and high gradient tributaries. So if you, if you <clears throat> look at where fish are by life stage, that's what this shows, essentially looks at at where production is occurring, uh, sort of a typical year in the, in the clear water system. So here you have life stage, you have egg incubation, summer rearing, and overwintering. And in between these stages, you have some type of dispersal or redistribution that's going on. So between, uh, at, at fry emergence, there's some sort of dispersal that takes place in the spring for the young zero-age fish the fish rear during the summer, and then in the fall, there's a very extensive redistribution of fish as fish move to, to find good overwintering habitat. So essentially, if you took all the spawners in the system, sort of divided them up, where do fish spawn? Well, they, they, there are very few spawning in the, in the lower main stem, a lot of fish spawning in the, in the, uh, the low gradient tributaries, almost nothing in what you'd call an off-channel habitat, uh, a lot in the upper main stem and a lot in the steep tributaries, which, which is a bit surprising for kind of your, your old school way of thinking about coal. Extensive dispersal, and if you went out and looked during the, uh, the, the summer, this is kind of what you'd find. You'd find, you'd find quite a few in the, in the lower main stem, a lot in the, the low gradient tributaries, they start to move into the, to the off-channel ponds with a spring dispersal. So there's, there's some fish that are showing up in the off-channel ponds. There, there's 
there's fewer in the steeper tributaries. So basically, fry are moving out of the steeper tributaries, moving, moving to lower gradient uh, habitats. And then with the fall rains, there's an extensive redistribution. So if you go out at, at smolt and look to see where the smolts are coming from, very few are coming from the lower main stem, a lot from the low gradient tributaries, a lot from the off-channel ponds, and essentially none from the upper steep uh, uh, streams. So with that, what we... Okay. I'm going to have to really... I'm going to have to speed this up just a tad here. Anyway, what we... If you look to see where fish... Um, what was going on at that, at that time, what we concluded was that basically the low gradient tributaries were essentially being seeded. So here's a, here's a typical low gradient tributary. And essentially you see no increase with, uh, with spawner density in terms of small eel. But if you, if you went to the ponds and you say you went before, even before, uh, before winter, you looked at the number of fish moving into off channel ponds, there's a relationship between the, the number of spawners upstream and the number of fry that would be moving into the ponds to overwinter. So what we concluded was that was that these types of streams were under or, or types of habitats were were underseeded. So we we strategically located the acclimation sites in the upper parts of the steep streams, and that's where we that this is essentially where we took took the the adults. In this area, primarily, we started in this area, then it, then it, it expanded to to these uh, to these other streams. This just shows you where the off-channel ponds are; they're in the lower part of the system. So, results. I'm going to go through this real quick. This just simply shows for the number of years. This is this is the the results that are presented in a paper by uh, Risi uh, Sharma. Um, and, and this shows the number of, of naturally spawning, uh, natural origin spawners in the system, and the number of fish that we took for broodstock. So, so it's a small portion. The numbers are here on the, on the bottom, the number that we took uh, for broodstock. So then if you look at the number of outmigrants, these are natural outmigrants in the blue. The red is... Uh, Supplementation out migrants estimated to be leaving the system at the at the uh, mouth of the Clearwater. <clears throat> Excuse me. This this year here we had a flood event, lost all the stock. So it's it's just sort of a there was no supplementation that occurred in that in that year. This shows the resulting uh, number of spawners that returned. So natural origin and supplementation origin. I'm going to rescale this because the, the year that we had no supplementation that occurred, we had a phenomenal return. I never believed it, it could have happened. It did happen. Happened all along the coast, actually. So just to rescale this so you can see it better, there's, there's kind of a comparison between the natural origin spawners spawning in the wild and the supplementation origin spawners spawning in the wild. So we're beginning, beginning to amp... Well, actually, what this shows is we are amplifying. What we've done is we've amplified. So here's what we took originally in the first chart, number of spawners that we took, broodstock, and then basically how we amplified that over uh, upon, upon the return. So essentially with the, 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 uh, the red here, these are, these are additional spawners that are essentially being added to the, to the system. And so we have, a set of, we have two sets of years. So this table simply shows we, had, we have a lot of data where there's no supplementation of any kind to look at reproductive success. And off to the right, these are the years where we had, we had fish that came back to spawn. So what this, what this table shows, for example, here's the number of natural origin spawners. Here's the number of supplementation origin spawners spawning in the wild. Here's the number of natural smolts. Here's the smolts per spawner for the aggregate. And here's the proportion of supplementation origin fish spawning in the wild, okay? So here we get to reproductive success, and I'm, I'm just, just about done here. Um, so if you take all the unsupplemented years and plot them, uh, uh, 
Smoltz per spawner, you get this kind of a kind of a curve. This is a typical curve that you see for coho. It shows essentially the very strong operation of density dependence that, that's going on with coho. Get this nice, nice curve here. Now what would happen, let's just say hypothetically, if you, if you had a, a loss in reproductive success, this might be something that you would see. So here, here's an example, just a hypothetical. If you, if you had reproductive success dropped to 70% of fully fit. The curve is there, the original curve, and all the points are pulled down and to the, to the right. So that just shows the effect of a loss in, in say, fitness. But what do we see? This, this is, th these are the years with supplementation. Shows the, the, the curve that it is associated with that. Shows you also on the bottom the proportion of supplementation origin fish that, that were uh, occurring in those years, and then if we plot them together, that's essentially what we what we get. So there are these curves, and so I was uh, I think I'm more interested, I think, in what goes on in the kind of the center of the mass. So if you just pull out the extremes, the endpoints essentially for those, replot it, you get something like that. So that this is just the kind of the center of the the points. The, the, um, the upshot is that we concluded that the, there was very little, if any, loss in, in fitness uh, comparing unsupplemented years to, uh, to supplemented years. And finally, this is, a, this is a chart that shows small yield across all years for the clear water. We essentially conclude that the system is, is essentially operating at capacity. So, the, you know, the project has been stopped. But what's interesting is there, there is something different. If you look at the pattern out here, this is, a, this is a bit different out here. We don't know exactly what's going on, but look at this. If you look at the percentage of fish that are produced in the system as smolts and look at the proportion that are, that are coming from ponds, the contribution from ponds, there's an increase over time. This is, this is kind of interesting. At the same time, if this is true, then you would think that we must be seeing a, probably a, a decrease coming from low gradient tributaries. And in fact, that's what, we've, what, we, what we see. So in conclusion, we concluded that supplementation was effective at amplifying the, the, um, the abundance of natural spawners. And we concluded there was, there was essentially little or no adverse effect on reproductive fitness. We found no evidence for an increase in total natural production. But the change in the relative contributions of pond and runoff tributary smolts, we don't have this sorted out. We're still working on, on uh, the data. But we believed it's due to, first of all, we think it has something to do with the siting of the smolt release sites. And we also think that, as we've looked at a lot of information, we've concluded that there's a loss in productive capacity of certain kinds of tributaries, and we think it's due to logging and, and essentially the loss of, of uh, large wood in those, uh, in those areas. So that's it. Let's thank Larry. <laughs> Oh, we have some time for some questions, and then it'll take us up to uh, a morning break. So, sorry about that, Greg. No, 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 pause. I'll start with Dave, and then I see Eric, and then we can um, add on a cue from there. Yes, was there a need for, and were you able to correct for harvest impacts? Well, essentially, what's happened with harvest is it's it's essentially gone away. There's very little harvest on on wild co, and as there has been for about the last 15 years. The Canadians. Their coho are sort of going away, and so everybody kind of came to the conclusion that they really needed to change the fisheries, and that's happened. Is this? Okay. Um, so one of your conclusions was that the natural smolt production didn't change. Um, I'm curious about the to, yeah the total for the whole the total system. the total for the system the yeah. sm natural smolt production didn't change. 
One of the goals, at least from my interpretation of what's taking place at this workshop, is to increase the numbers of adult um, coho in the Shasta River from the supplementation project. And I'm wondering if you can comment on um, changes in the numbers of natural origin adult coho salmon in that system as a consequence of the supplementation. In the, in the clear water? Yeah, in the, with the analysis you did. Uh, well, I mean, we, we, you know, we augmented spawning and essentially there was no change on total capacity and now we've stopped that and so we're, we're watching what's happened. The whole story hasn't been written yet, but, but what, it, what it appears is, is going to happen now is essentially, we're, I mean, we're just going back to the, to the way we were, I think. Uh, so essentially, we haven't we haven't done anything. We have you know the, there there is some some habitat restoration work that's going on. But you know this is a, I think this is a good example okay. that when you stop doing what you're doing for supplementation, it goes back to to where the system was. And so this you know was a was there was a reason for doing this. This was not a conservation situation where we were trying to save the stock. You know. Okay. So I mean. In in some systems, the actual treatment is um, the return of the hatchery adults. You're having them spawn in the wild with, in, with the hope that they're going to produce. Yeah, that's what we were trying to achieve. Right. And yeah. so you would conclude that there was no effect of those on the... Reproductive fitness. Well, that I understand. But on the NOR, the natural origin right. abundance, right. you would presume from your analysis that there wasn't yeah. It wasn't a change simply because the, yeah we that the that the environment was is more or less at its capacity okay yeah uh, Kim you're next uh, uh, your your data showed that you had good success on your supplemented um, on your supplemented uh, fish your you, you marked them, presumably? They're all marked, 100%, okay. yeah. And you and you and then you, you looked at the returning adults, you have a good data on that. Your, you showed that you had a, you, you called it amplifying the uh, abundance? Well, just your, amplifying the, basically the natural... Their success uh, rate. The, well, the natural, the, the abundance of natural spawners in the system. Your, your fish produced more adults, your, your young... Between the, in the aggregate, there were more spawners spawning naturally. Okay. The only the only thing I was confused with all the graphs you're showing there, your uh, your 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 smolts per spawner, those curves, the declining curves. I would have thought when you added your your uh, your supplemented fish, that curve should have gone way up. I'm curious what the no, from that. no, because we're the the smolts per spawner measure. That's the number of natural smolts being produced by the fish that spawn. The fish that spawn were either natural origin spawners, or they were supplementation origin spawners, but they're spawning in the wild, and they're producing natural origin smolts, if you wish, okay? So the number of, so essentially, if, if, you, didn't have, if, if you didn't have any change in fitness, the curves theoretically would be identical. Okay, let me see if I can state that. Your planted fish produced more returning adults, correct? We increased the, the number of spawners in the aggregate between natural origin fish coming back whose parents were natural origin and supplementation origin fish whose parents we took into the hatchery. But now they came back where we sighted the, the acclimation ponds. We were trying to get them to come back to certain areas in the watershed, up into the steeper streams to increase the escapements in those areas. We did that. So in the aggregate, on the average, we basically amplified the number of spawners. Rich, can you clarify that better? What? Yeah, I think there was some confusion. And your, res your response to Eric's question, I think, led at least me to believe, and I think maybe Eric to conclude, that you didn't produce more natural origin adults with your added hatchery adults to the spawner population. Right, natural origin adults, right, which would be the which would be the result of natural origin 
smolts. I, I didn't think your data showed that because if you hadn't added those hatchery origin fish to the spawner population, your your total spawners would have been much lower in those years right. that you added, right. right? Right. But the productivity of the aggregate was equal to the productivity of yes. the natural. So you actually did boost the NORs in the years of supplementation. Well, but not the, in you essence, just in, the, just in yeah, those years, yeah. because you didn't change the curve, the curve right, stayed right. the same. But then as soon as you took it away, it, it, just, it went back to its, its normal state. Right, it's in the process of doing that. The, I mean, we had, we had called them hatchery fish and, and, and natural origin fish spawning in nature. We, we tried to achieve that, that happened. They then produce, naturally produce smolts. So their progeny are all naturally produced. That number, in the aggregate, in general, we don't think we've really increased for the system. The number of naturally produced smolts. Does that make sense? If, 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 you, if you didn't increase the number of natural origin smolts, then your smolts per spawner for the aggregate is lower than your smolts per spawner it, it, without hatchery fish. Then oh, the, that's, yes, then the you're, you're right. The productivity is lower for the aggregate. Oh, oh I, I'm sorry. All right, let me, let, me, let me show you. Rich is right. Um, but what's, what's, hap what's happening is, is you have to look at the axis here. So there's more spawners, there's more spawners spawning, which moves you further out over here onto the axis. But because of the strong density dependence, that affects the number of smolts produced per spawner. So you're, you're simply moving on this axis, but it keeps you on this curve. So you don't produce more smolts per spawner. This is really an important point. I mean, this is really a, a really, really important point. This curve is really important to understand. Coho demonstrate this kind of a curve everywhere. There's strong density dependence, and there's even strong density dependence when you're at fairly low densities. It's the nature of the beast. They compete with one another. They affect each other's growth. But, but, the, but the curve hasn't changed here. So that's the conclusion that we didn't affect reproductive fitness or reproductive success. We can talk more about this, but uh, I know you have to kind of get your head around a little bit. Greg? Uh, let's see. Michael, is this right on this curve here? Because otherwise I've got Tom ahead. Go ahead, Tom. Mine's on the curve, too. Larry? The exciting thing about what you said, I, I had to ask this question, is the four ponds produced over a thousand adult coho. If you increase it to eight ponds, would that curve change? You know, actually, let, let me, not to belabor this, but I, I think it, had we not done this, here's, here's my hunch, can't prove this, but had we not done this, I think we would see, to, we, we would have seen fewer total smolts being produced because I do think that the system the productive capacity for the system is less now because of the effects of logging. So really the, the wood loads in these streams, I mean these streams have just been blitzed logging wise. And I actually started studying the effects of logging on the Clearwater River in 1972 with a fellow by the name of Jeff Cedarholm. So I really know the system. And so I do think that it's, it's, it's kind of ratcheted down. And I think what we did was basically mask that sense or that, that that, but that's another story, not to get into all that. But my question is, if you made eight ponds instead of four, would yes. that curve change? Well, if, yeah, if you, if you, yes. So if you made, if you doubled the number of ponds in the system, and this gets a little complicated, but, but would, the, would the number of smolts being produced change? Yes. It's a longer story. It has to do with what we call productivity and capacity and how that kind of works. That's, that's another story. So yes, if you, you know, if you create more of that type of habitat, you will have a, a positive effect on the population. My, my second question is, I showed you the pond on Mill Creek on the Scott River. I think it produces a couple of hundred adult 
CoHO2 in that complex. Do you feel the same? Uh, I'd have to stop and think about it. Uh, but, but, but just to clarify something about these ponds, you know, when the fish come back to the, like when they, when they use these overwintering ponds, we're seeing the same thing in the Kalamath. This is exciting stuff. You have fish in the, in the Kalamath that we know, juveniles that are pit tagged in the summer, we have documented uh, proof that some of them will travel up to 150 miles to find overwinter habitat. Well, when they come back as adults, they don't go back to that overwinter habitat. They go back to where they respond. And so that was kind of the model that we were using here. I could talk about this all day, but, you, but Greg, you've got to move on, I know. So. Michael, Michael, you're next, and then I think we're going to have our um, morning break. Um, I, the, the system that you're, you, you studied here is, is, is very different from the stuff we're talking about with the from the Shasta system? Uh, yeah, the, very different, very different situation, but, yeah. But I'm wondering, and, and, and of course the reasons that you were doing the project were right. very different too, so. But I'm wondering if you could maybe highlight for us some, some of the things that you learned in this project that you think would be directly relevant to the kinds of things that um, we're talking about here today. And, that, and, yeah. and then I'll just ask you the second one too, so you well, can so well, we'll do it. We'll be talking about that in the panel, I think, a little bit this afternoon. But I think, I mean, you know, not to let the whole cat out of the bag, but, but if, I were, if I were king for a day, I'd be doing something like this in the, in the Kalamath system. And, and I know, you know, we, we, uh, Carlos and I were kind of, we were talking about this in the question and answers yesterday, but my, my sense, this 450 square mile basin, I don't think the genetics have been done where we really know the story. And, and this is a diverse system. And we believe that there are differences in genetics within that system worth preserving. So when I go to a much larger system with even more diversity, I, I think that there, there's still something here worth preserving. And that you can amplify it to, to keep it from going extinct while you're doing the important habitat stuff that needs to, to go on. Could you also just comment very briefly on the uh, acclimation ponds and what they were like? Yeah, they were they were fairly crude for the most part. Um, they were just you know temporary ponds constructed to keep fish. We actually held fish for about we generally about two months. So we 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 put them in there sometime in February. Uh, no, no, these were these were earthen. You could use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we actually created these, but but you could do this sort of thing that you're talking about, Michael. We, so we held them about two months, really uh, imprinted them to those sites, and uh, and then uh, and then allowed them to go out volitionally. All right. Well, let's thank Larry again.